Okay, so this is our fourth installment of our Southeastern Native American fact, fiction, and folklore series. The series is a collaboration between the Florence Indian Mound Museum and the Alabama chapter of the Trail of Tears Association. So we're trying to do some of these presentations in person and some of them are going to be uh, recorded and housed on our YouTube channel. This one has been recorded previously and you're watching it now from our channel. Uh, we are grateful to be joined by Frederick Murphy, uh, who is the founder of and documentarian with History Before Us, and Kimberly Knight, the founder of Black Indians North Carolina. And they are joining us to talk about um, their upcoming documentary, Duality, a collection of Afro-Indigenous perspectives. So I'm going to turn it over to Frederick and Kimberly here, but uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you for having us. We greatly appreciate it. You know, these types of opportunities, we um, tend to jump on them as soon as they come about, just because, you know, the opportunities to have previous opportunities to have these type of conversations weren't necessarily as, as afforded, right? As they are now, we're, we're coming to find and we're just definitely taking full advantage of these opportunities to educate the masses about the things that we've researched and the things that we've uncovered throughout this whole process of, uh, of uh, filming and documenting these important stories by very, very passionate people. So we are very glad to be here today. Thank you so much for having us. It's good to be here. Hello, everyone. Yes, definitely. And happy Valentine's Day, everybody. <laughs> All right. So I have the screen control. I'm going to move on to us. And Kim, if you want to start off, ladies first. Oh, thank you so much. So gracious. <laughs> so um, my name is Kimberly Knight, everyone. I'm originally from Eastern North Carolina, but I'm the founder of a nonprofit called Black Indians North Carolina. Um, I'm definitely an advocate for Afro-Indigenous people. I'm a social media influencer and blogger. My blog is called The Lux Blog NC, where we cover culture, lifestyle content here in North Carolina. I'm an HIV awareness advocate. I serve for the Wake Forest University Board for the Gilead Compass Center, so about Black um, faith and HIV. So that is a board that I'm very proud to serve on and do awareness with. And I'm also a licensed clinical social worker associate therapist. So I see people clinically for their mental health service needs. But today I'm serving in the capacity of being a co-director and co-producer of this awesome documentary coming out that you'll be hearing more about today. Yep. And uh, my name is uh, Frederick Murphy, uh, founder of History Before Us, which started in 2017. Um, where I go around collecting oral histories, visiting historical sites, uh, historic history influencer, in various different cities across the country, collaborating with the local um, city, county, et cetera, et cetera, to bring awareness to their local uh, history. Uh, filmmaker, documentarian, uh, as well as a licensed clinical mental health therapist. So that's something that Kim and I definitely um, leaned heavily into when we um, started this documentary and even brainstorming what it would look like. And so um, those, um, you know, parallels that are identical uh, in a lot of different ways, social workers and counselors, there's a lot of overlap with some of the things in which we do. Um, it it kind of made this process uh, and the project a lot easier than what it possibly could have been. Um, I am a board member of the Slave Dwelling Project, uh, as well as the uh, James K. Polk Historic Site um, West, uh, West Side History um, Club here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the president of the Tennessee uh, African American Historical Research Group in my hometown of Clarksville, Tennessee. And so um, definitely glad to be here. And we are going to get into a presentation that Kim and I travel uh, across the country um, enlightening individuals about the project, as well as some history components from a historical trauma standpoint um, connected to these two uh, cultures and also identifying the intersectionality within, within both. So we'll get started with that.
So our film, let's talk about duality, a collection of Afro-Indigenous perspectives. Um, this film is a collection of personal reflections told by individuals of both African and Indigenous ancestry who identify as Afro-Indigenous across America. But you're also going to get to see in this film a lot of content from historians, scholars, academics, community members, tribal community members about their perspective about the intersection of African Americans and Native Americans. And this has been a very exciting time for Frederick and I because this has not only been something personal where we've researched our own family history, but also finding out our own relationship and everything, which was great, which we'll get more into later. But we, I really love this question we always pose of what does it mean to be Afro-Indigenous? And for me who identifies personally as someone who is Afro-Indigenous, I come from a background that is strongly a African, African-American and Native American background. And growing up in those dual cultures meant so much to me, but to keep it short and brief for today, I will say the beauty of what I found from growing up in such a African and Native infused household or family was the importance of dually knowing both heritages. It was very important for my family for me to know both and not look at one being better than the other. It was about the beauty of seeing the kindness, the grace, the culture, the music, the dance, the beadwork, the food um, intersection, the quilting intersection, all of that of how Southeastern natives and Africans were intertwined. And yeah, that's a little bit about, you know, my perspective when it comes to this film. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the film is an act of humanity. I always tell individuals when you are purposely seeking stories and you're utilizing your platform and you're approaching it with care and sensitivity and empathy, um, then you're doing an act of humanity. And that's what this whole film has been about. Um, we're not looking at what um, society says to identify who you are or don't care about the blood quantum or any any of all any of that stuff right and so um being doing such has really i feel allowed us to take a lot of certain types of um um subjective opinions out of it <laughs> and solely focusing on a person's or person's lived experiences and that is what made uh that's what what has made this film in my opinion uh very powerful and so uh, we don't have a lot of pictures on this slide, but um, we do have a collection of uh, my ancestors as well as Kim's and the linkage between Kim and I, because we are related and we'll get into that. Um, and so just to pay homage to our ancestors, this lady to the far left is my great, great grandmother, Pereira Tally, uh, Pereira Flower Tally, and this is her cousin, Matt, Maddie Cunningham, and they are both Afro-Indigenous. And uh, you'll see also a direct link um, kinfolk from uh, Kim coming up here in a second in the next slide actually so let's go ahead and hit there so I just wanted to identify these individuals because you've seen the pictures yeah so this lovely photo is my great-grandparents this is Cornelius quote-unquote Bud Wiggins and Mimi Wiggins they are my great-grandparents from eastern North Carolina and both Afro-Indigenous people here um, and the things that we like to consider with this film is, is our film unique? Does it stand out? Is it something that is content people want to see on a, you know, national level? What or who could be opposing forces? Um, something that we've thought of and considered when making this film is who would can find this film, you know, enjoyable and understanding and an educational tool and those who may not, who may see it as division or see it as something that is um, a issue towards tribal sovereignty or an issue towards different communities. And, you know, for us, it really is about unification and understanding of how these two marginalized groups connectively intersected and worked together to fight against a lot of things that they were going through injustice wise, socially, economically, and historically. Um, is it engaging and persuasive? Like, what is this content? Is it engaging to you? That's why we've been doing these types of talks, because we wanted to talk to the people directly. We wanted to meet people where they are in communities. We want this to be a talking piece that can go on for years to come 
personally for me I don't think I remember a film to this nature since the 80s with James Earl Jones narrating Black Indians a film and it mostly focused on the West um, for the most part but this film gives you kind of an idea of seeing the Southeast as well as we went out West as well for a little bit so I'm really excited about that part but these are my great grandparents and super proud of the works and things they did with their lives and the family lineage they've left about. So I'll let yeah. Frederick jump in. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like, like Kim had stated, you know, it, through our research, um, we haven't seen just a lot of um, things out there from a documentary standpoint, addressing what it is that we're addressing. Um, and again, that's not to say that it, it's not because people have various different platforms that's accessible, you know, that Google may not capture everything, right? <laughs> so um, like Kim had, had said, we wanted to make sure uh, that we covered these questions, right? The, the engaging and persuasive piece, of course, was, was very huge. And, and that is to the persuasive pieces, you know, um, based on what society has deemed um, native or indigenous as it relates to looks right from a face value standpoint um can you open your mind to to look at things differently versus what this hollywood figure of what an indigenous person looks like um and then uh, lastly you know does it cause people to jump into action and what does action looks like it, it looks like a lot of different things it looks like okay i've gotten this oral history and it mentions x y and z so now i am going to delve deeper into what that does, right? What that looks like. So that's um, jumping into action. Or do you seek more uh, organizations that are centered on the intersectionality of Afro-Indigeneity and, uh, and utilize whatever resources that you have to help uh, amplify what it is that, that they're doing um, uh, or simply just going out and supporting uh, as well. And so, uh, we put all of these things into consideration when we identify the participants in the film, the places that we uh, wanted to film at, and um, also some of the, the criticism that may come with it. I mean, it's just, you can't expect for everyone to be on the same page. And so um, we have gotten a little backlash, but more love than not. Um, and happy to say that on uh Valentine's Day, we got more love than not. So um, it's it's been a it's been a good journey thus far. So we will move on to the next uh, slide. And I'll just add as we're moving to the next slide, the also a critical piece for I want people to think about as we move into this very important topic here about historical trauma is in our nation there are many states that are going through the possibility of restricting access to history for students in public schools. And as a former educator myself, I worked in education for 14 years. It's something very true and dear to my heart to make sure there's educational, historically documented resources like this film that can be available to the public for parents to use as not only a, you know, entertainment piece, but a teaching tool for their children as well for where they feel the school systems may slack in those areas. So I think this is very important and timely of the release of our film this upcoming year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's get into a therapist intuition. As you both heard, you know, earlier, we are a therapist, so we can definitely connect in that way. Um, I love the fact that Frederick and I both come from these very similar disciplines. Um, and on a master level, we were able to learn about all these different records of trauma and influence, but it also helps us kind of cultivate where the film's topics should go. Um, and it is not culturally safe to assume that everyone within a group, community, or family has been impacted by historical trauma or by the same experiences as others. So I'm going to start with the generational enslavement of African Indigenous people. There's been historical documentation that we found for the film, as well as you have, might have been heard of yourself, where there has been enslavement of both people of African and Native descent. Um, unfortunately, this situation where I think the piece of the film that's really going to be impactful is when people get to see us with historical documentation and historians speaking to the light of how this generational enslavement has been this interconnection of not only unity had to happen because there were situations where certain tribes would take in people who were enslaved Africans in order to give them their freedom and their rights. But also we do know the other flip side of the coin where unfortunately there were people that were enslaved 
by the five civilized tribes. And now there are people fighting for their freedom, which you will get to see parts of that in this film are still fighting for the rights of the freedmen who were featured, uh, that were people that were enslaved or the descendants of people who were enslaved by these particular tribes and the rights that have been taken away from them since then. So I'm really excited for that piece of the film to be shown. Also, disconnection from family norms and loss of cultural traditions. This one's a big one for me because I've met so many people on this journey and even beforehand where people did not have a distinct connection to their family traditions or culture on either side of their um, ethnicity for a duality of their African or native side, but are wanting to reconnect. And I think the reconnection journey is not spoken about enough about how important that is and how we should be more welcoming for people to be reconnected to their um, African and native ancestry because it's a journey. There's so many reasons why people have been disconnected culturally from their tradition. And I think it's very important for us to highlight how that disconnection piece there. And I'll stop there because I want to give Frederick opportunity to share as well. Well, you know, to, to kind of piggyback off of that, when we talk about the loss of, loss of cultural traditions and disconnection from, from family norms, you know, when we talk about the checklist, like when you go to fill out an application, when you go to apply for school, like all these different things, it, it marginalizes your true authentic self if you have to choose, right? And so in those types of manners, the way that historically, um, whenever this... Um, concept of race, right, this construct uh, comes into play, it it really strips individuals from the opportunity to connect with their authentic, genuine self based on what his, history states, as well as what your family has passed down from generation to generation. And so when we talk about the reclassification with Walter Plecker and all these other different entities that have happened historically that has led to the stripping of uh, individuals' cultural norms. It is powerful to see that some people are uh, in this process and where they're trying to um, reconnect. And I'm one of those individuals that are that's in that space. Um, in, you know, since Kim and I have been able to make our family connections and uh, me delving deeper into uh, some of the things that my great grandma, my great my, the my grandmother that you all saw previously, had left from um, oral history, um, it speaks directly to the duality of um, African descent as well as indigenous descent. And so what we're hoping is that through this film, and we've seen this to where people are standing up when we do Q and A's and uh, giving presentations where individuals are proudly saying that this is what has been said and this is the evidence and this and that, but I feel that I have to kind of make myself small and just be this one thing because of social uh, social norms um, that unfortunately had been affected by uh, colonization uh, in a negative way. So um, that's why I just wanted to, to lend to what it is that you were just saying, Kim. So if you wanted to pick back up with mur missing and murdered indigenous women. Sure. So the MMIW, as it's commonly acronymed, um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, uh, there are many people who have uh, multiple national chapters for this that are in different states. Here in North Carolina, we do have a um, community that has a MMIW committee. And I'd like to highlight Dr. Crystal Cavalier Keck for the work that she does. Uh, her nonprofit is Seven Directions of Service, but also she is a board member for the MMIW Women here in North Carolina. And what this speaks to is talking about missing and murdered Indigenous women. Yes, it sounds very self-explanatory, but how women are going missing in Indigenous communities and other communities they live in how there's murders happening where people are reclassified as other ethnic backgrounds. So the data is not reported authentically of the women being identified as indigenous. So unfortunately that causes the identification of this being a issue in certain communities to be a hot topic for law enforcement becomes dwindled because it's like, well, there's not enough research to support that this many women were identified as indigenous in this particular community that were harmed in this type of way. So that's why census is important, data reporting, self-identifying is important because now you have the opportunity to be able to authentically identify as your own ethnic background. Mental health, emotional, physical, sexual, and financial abuse. 
both of these ethnic backgrounds of African and Native have experienced mental health areas of concern. And for both Frederick and I's therapy, we've seen in our work professionally, but also just seen in the community work we've been doing with this film of seeing how the emotional and physical and all of these abuses have caused people either to not identify with their indigenous or African-American ancestry, causing people not to duly identify, but to feel they emotionally have to stay um, in one category in order to be accepted in the community they live in. This also has affected people with pursuing tribal enrollment and pursuing the identity of their ancestors. It's been something that has been very emotionally kept. And then when we get into the sexual piece about the historical traumas of children being birthed out of these enslaved relationships that occurred that were non-consensual, we have to get deeper into that where it took place for both Native and African-American uh, people. And that you will see information about in this film when we talk about how in depth culturally there were so many things that were taking place in mental health abuse. Mm -hmm. um, which leads me into financial abuse and generational poverty and wealth gap earnings. This is where we're still seeing even present day where there's still a generational poverty gap. And the beauty of going, of looking at all these different variations of tribes, because I know people sometimes get really fascinated with hearing just Cherokee, Choctaw, you know, Seminole, um, and, you know, just hearing different tribes that are more commonly versed out into the mass media but there are so many tribal communities that are affected with generational poverty and wealth gap earnings. Even locally where I am in North Carolina, there are indigenous communities that are only state recognized and not federally recognized. And for those who may not know the difference, federal means that the federal government recognizes them as a Native American tribe. State recognized means the state alone only recognizes them as a Native American tribe. And an issue that comes in is here, there are people in state recognized tribe communities in my state that do not have access to Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. They do not have access to certain technologies, which limits them with education resources of doing online learning and distance learning. It limits them with remote work options and opportunities to apply to different positions. So there's a lot of issue where generational poverty and wealth gap earnings are a major concern. And then also in African-American communities, where we're having issues of having access to clean waterways, issues with earnings of, you know, potential places of workplaces. Unfortunately, even in my communities here in North Carolina, again, I use an example, we're seeing where there's a lot of, unfortunately, like internet cafes or pawn shops or different uh, non-wealth building entities being placed in those communities where people are not having access to certain job placements where they can make higher earning wage to even be considered above the poverty line in America, which is very concerning. So I'm gonna stop there because I can go on and on as a social worker. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna pause for Frank uh, to jump back in. You're, you're good. You're you're making all of these great points. And, and in, in addition to mental health, um, when we talk about um, the plight of those from African and in, in native um, ancestry, um, the overarching um, premise of what mental health looks like, um, a lot of it is invisible, a lot of it is unseen. Um, it's the um, internal scarring, if you will, and not the things that are so evident that you know you may see from an outwardly standpoint. So for instance, as it relates to mental health, one of the earliest known quote unquote uh, diagnoses um, was back in the 1860s. And um, the um, premise of this uh, diagnosis was um, if a person had ran away from a plantation, um, they were deemed mentally incompetent. And the term is drapetomania that was given in the 1860s. And it's pretty much to say that, why would you run from some place that would provide you food, shelter, clothing, um, shoes, uh, sustenance, all these things, right? It did not make sense to an enslaver or other uh, individuals in these specific communities that someone would go, right? Um, and so, that in itself, having that term coined for specifically people of color of uh, African descent or Af and or indigenous descent to try to escape their situation, 
um, was just asinine within itself, right? Uh, and then when we go on throughout the various different generations, we see this um, um, these different oppressive acts that are very intentional, continuously compounding and affecting individuals from a mental and emotional health standpoint. And until there is acknowledgement, until there's apologies, until there is equitable measures across the board, right? Um, people will still struggle with the mental and emotional and physical and sexual and financial abuse effects that history has um, stowed upon them. And um, there was even, uh, there's this book called Ebony and Ivy in where um, the book is focusing on enslaved labor at Ivy League schools. Um, well, what was happening is they were util utilizing um, Native American bodies as well as um, people of African descent uh, for their um, medical students, um, utilizing them as for from an experimentation standpoint. Of course, um, if the individuals were already dead then they're utilizing their body, but the, even those who were still alive, they just weren't um, giving them numbing mechanisms to go in and do these types of surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. So when you look at um, the pain threshold now in which um, medication is prescribed, uh, you know, it's well known that um, uh, people of African descent and most minorities um, don't get the proper care that's needed as it relates to pain medication or pain management because of these things that have happened historically uh, in which the public believes that, uh, and even some medical professions believe that due to their historical um, existence, that they don't need as much. And we just know that is simply to not be true. Um, but the numbers are very skewed um, as it relates to people of color versus uh, their European counterparts from a health standpoint, as well as mental health standpoint. Um, some of the most misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed people in this country are people of African descent. And so we have to be very mindful of that. And we do touch into historical trauma in the film as well. And the generational poverty and wealth gap earnings that goes without you know, speaking, we know this to be very evident um, throughout multiple fields in this country. Uh, and so then when we move down to the systemic racism and social justice issues, um, you know, the people out West, the indigenous folks out West weren't fighting for nothing when, you know, these different pipelines were coming through uh, their, their waterways, uh, right? Uh, we know what big industry brings and we know that land, they're not building any more of it. And so um, if you have an opportunity to take advantage of a uh, community that may not have the resources to speak to stand up for themselves, um, then that's predatory behavior. And we see that all the time. And so it's been a blessing to also see so many uh, grassroots efforts for people in their local communities coming together and saying that we are going to fight against this systemic racism and social justice issues, because we know that is factual to be, right? It doesn't take a rocket science to see that these things don't happen in affluent neighborhoods, right? And so what we do is we take advantage of these marginalized groups that are quite frankly, historically used to it. So it may not sting as bad. It's just, oh, well, you know, they coming in and doing what it is that they're doing. So, you know, we got to get out of here, boom, boom, boom. But the tide is changing and there are people that are standing up, not that people didn't in the past, but even more so now because there's more uh, resources and more avenues to show these injustices versus what were there uh, previously. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a great point to lead off of with systemic racism and social justice issues organizations like AIM, American Indian Movement. And we also look at, you know, the civil rights movement. These types of rights were going on at the same time where people were fighting for social rights and social action together. And I think it's really empowering to see now that there are more AIM chapters becoming back reactivated. Um, I know there's the here in our state as well, North Carolina, also seeing that people are getting more involved with social media, with social justice movement, and seeing more people identifying and really doing the research to support the areas where they feel they have been disconnected from their family ancestry. So that's why I think this piece about systemic racism that has affected both marginalized groups is gonna be so important for people to see in this film. Um, and military engagement interaction, there's been documentation of both of these entities serving. 
in our military. And then also the injustices that they had to go through when there were still some areas of where people were not respected for the ethnicity they were, even though they were serving in the same war. Um, and there's been, of course, many films about this and many content that's been documented about this. But I think we wanted to make sure we highlighted that in this presentation today about how these two served and how the impact of how both of these ethnic groups, especially African-Americans serving in the military, caused social change, caused, you know, major social change. And we're talking about areas of slavery being abolished. And then we're talking about areas of injustices against people being the first of to invent so many different inventions that supported military intelligence. I think it's really important to make sure we highlight the works that both of these ethnic groups have contributed to our military. And we've already kind of spoken on marginalized communities of people of color. Now the Indian normal schools that actually went viral about two years ago, back in 20, well, three years now, almost yeah. 2020. <laughs> Woo, time flies y'all. <laughs> Um, but it's almost three years since we've had the pandemic begin. And that really went viral where people were in orange t-shirts, you may remember. And um, and then seeing these different messages that were on different shirts, you know, child, children not being um, forgotten and left behind and things. And then I think it's so important about continuing the research and information about Indian normal schools and how they were low funded public educational systems and still are in many reservation communities and African-American communities as well. And then I already kind of touched based about the lack of access to public utilities and technology. Um, I have gotten to see just even with traveling with this film, just being able to see in different parts of our nation of where you can see communities are still behind and affected even in the 2022 when we were out filming a lot in 21 and 22, seeing how people were still marginalized and how their access to these public utilities and technology was very limited, um, even affecting us with filming in certain places because we didn't have access to technology. Um, but we were able to capture as much as we possibly could. But I think this is something that people need to realize that we're here on this virtual platform and thankfully uninterrupted with service. But there are people that are in communities right now, both of these both dual groups that do not have access to watch this content today. And that ourselves is very concerning, which is why we've decided we're going to do some community screenings as well as much as we can, along with the mainstream screenings, you know, in theaters and things like that. But being in community screenings where people can come from the community locally and be able to see this that may not have access to this technology at home. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I wanted to kind of circle back to the Indian normal schools is, and just to identify how these were places of uh, these were horrific places and the experiences that these uh, children had to experience, and not only the children, but also the um, the parents. Um, I read a book on Indian boarding schools um, about two years ago. I read this. Actually, it was close to around the time because I wanted to learn more about it um, in the time in which Kim was discussing and the letters that were going back and forth between the parents and the kids and some of these parents never seen their kids again. Um, some of these kids had died at these schools, um, you know, their uh, cultural norms as it relates to dress, hair, language, et cetera, et cetera, were um, taken away. And um, fortunately enough, there are survivors of Indian normal schools that are still out right now. So if you jump on YouTube and you type in Indian normal schools, uh, it will provide you with the depiction of what some of these individuals had to experience. And so when we talk about um, things such as the institution of slavery, we talk about Rosenwald schools, we talk about these things as it relates to, uh, uh, in which from a societal standpoint, more of the masses think about the African-American community. You also have to look at uh, Indian normal schools and what education looked like from that perspective from an indigenous community or Afro-Indigenous community as well. And so, um, and that's information that's still out there today in which individuals who are still living who had to attend or whose parents attended, you'll be able to get that um, first um, uh, firsthand experience from those individuals. So um, that's, an, again, another layer of trauma that some people may not necessarily think about. And uh, so when we talk about trauma, there's the three E's of trauma. Um, uh, individual trauma results from a or an event series or events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as being physically, emotionally harmful or threatening. 
and uh, has lasting adverse effects on individuals' physical, social, emotional well-being, emotional well-being, and or spiritual well-being. So that's the, the overall um, quick and dirty summary of what we've been talking about throughout this whole um, presentation thus far, thus far. And again, we made sure that individuals lived experiences throughout this film or their ancestors lived experiences will would stay true to exactly what it is that they say. Uh, because we know that our K through 12 experiences as well as higher education experiences in some cases, there has been, um, it's been skewed um, in a lot of different ways in which why we're seeing so many things such as CRT and other things that are coming out that's trying to ban, um, in my personal opinion, uh, so this is not anyone else's own, this is just my own personal opinion, uh, truth to be told, uh, which also is why it's very important that we go out there and we research ourselves, we ask elders, we go into these organizations and communities to identify what uh, documents they have um, uh, presently as well as historically. And so that's, um, these are the three E's of trauma in a nutshell. So some of the symptoms of historical trauma, and again, these are the things that are invisible that some people may not see, right? Um, these are a lot of things intrinsically that may be happening with people that you may not know. And it could be something that was triggered by a great, 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 great grandparent uh, and just passed down from generation to generation again, because if, they're, if this healing hasn't happened to where equitable measures are put in place as it relates to therapy, as it relates to medical, as it relates to financial, as it relates to land, as it relates to space, as it relates to housing, like all of these different things that we know, food deserts, all of these things that we know that we need in order to be holistically well, then you're gonna have more of these um, historical trauma pain points than not. So loss of sleep, uh, substance use, uh, isolation, the anger, the depression, fear and distrust, feelings of inferiority and anxiety. And a lot of people don't know um, that they're even, that this is what it is that they're even dealing with, right? And so what we try to do as therapists is make sure that people are able to name what that is. Well, it had to be very traumatic for a person's uh, ancestor to have to do, the, to take the trail of tears, right? Uh, you're literally being uprooted from everything that you've known, taken to this barren land and needing to do um, and cultivate that land uh, in, which was, in which you had was once plentiful. Right. And so it's starting over in an environment in which you not you don't know, and as well as in a climate that you may not necessarily be um, familiar with as well. So there's a lot of adapting that has to come with that. Uh, and in this specific case, it's forced. And one of the things that we made sure to highlight uh, on this, and I'll let Kim get into this, uh, because we filmed at a site on the Trail of Tears back in my hometown of Clarksville, Tennessee, Montgomery County, Tennessee, was that there were also people of African descent on the Trail of Tears. We don't see it in uh, pictures or it's not, and it's also not discussed often, but, um, you know, it, there were people of African descent and a lot of them that were on the Trail of Tears. And because of that journey, a lot of them are responsible for, for founding some of the historically um, black towns and settlements in Oklahoma, um, which had the most historic black in town, uh, black uh, town settlements, uh, even still to this day. And we just left the University of Oklahoma discussing this very same thing. So Kim, I'll let you get into that piece as it relates to the Trail of Tears and how did it feel for you to be on the Trail of Tears when we filmed you there? Yeah, thanks for talking about it. Trail of Tears definitely was something impactful, very personal. Um, having family that's from that area and knowing that the impact of what it was like to have to go through that process of being removed from the place you've always known and then having to go on this journey of really unwillingness and unknowingness of not knowing where we may end up, what will happen next, what is the livelihood of sustainability of life for myself, my family, um, and those all around me that are from my community. And it was just a really, you could feel the ancestral peace there of being present in that area. You could feel such a strong, overwhelming presence. And to be there in Tennessee was really enlightening because you got to see a similar, you know, the rivers and seeing like all the trees and just the area and just knowing that 
You don't know how cold or hot it was when this had to occur. You don't know what the temperatures were like, where people had to walk through lakes or ponds or whatever trails, you know, piece of it. And just knowing how historically it's been documented that how far this trail, which you will see in the trailers, which you'll get to see, is like showing a map of like how far they truly traveled. Yeah. Because we learn about it briefly in school that, okay, Native Americans went on Trail of Tears, specifically mm -hmm. Cherokee. That's the only tribe that's mentioned when we found out historically there were other tribes that were on the Trail of Tears. There were also people who were um, enslaved Africans on this trail and also enslaved indigenous people that were on this trail. So now as we go diving deeper past what the standard level of K through 12 education gives us, this film gives you a glimpse of learning truly how far they traveled, what the actual mileage was from one marker to the next, and then to be able to see it in Tennessee and then go to Oklahoma mm -hmm. and then see that this is how far the travel piece was to get there. It was truly overwhelming. And then realizing that there were people that also escaped. This is also a piece that people don't talk about much except for in specific academic texts about people that escaped. And then there became other kind of brand, um, branches of different tribes and bands of different tribes in other states, such as South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Kentucky, all these different areas, Georgia. You're hearing of different bands of xyz tribe and you're wondering well how did these different bands come about in the midst of the trail of tears happening where people were able to escape mm -hmm. and people were able to find settlement somewhere else some had to reclassify and re-identify mm -hmm. themselves as being african-american or european if they could pass quote unquote but it became where people had to sim assimilate into a society they were not accustomed to to be able to have survivorship and then the process now this is why people are especially since the pandemic, I've seen it on social media as an influencer a lot of people now reconnecting the pieces to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Of Now I see why great grandmother so-and-so was in Georgia when mm -hmm. we were originally from Tennessee a hundred years prior to that, or learning about different, you know, cultural bases that family was practicing. No one ever gave an explanation of why they cooked or beadwork or quilted or went to certain ceremonial things this way it's just something they did and no one talked about but that's why I like this uh piece here of symptoms of historical trauma because we do look at from a therapeutic standpoint about how all of these things can affect both of these communities identifying it and then also for me it just was really resonating to film in a space and think about these historical traumas they went through and the resilience of being here today so that's why it's beautiful to see that here I am, many, many generations removed from my family's history of starting in these different traumas that have started with them. Now I'm making a film about it. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there was plenty acts of resistance. I think when people talk about, uh, talk about uh, African-Americans um, and, and institutional slavery, um, they tend to not think about the multiple acts of resistance prior to the emancipation. And even in indigenous communities, um, there were plenty of acts of resistance once colonization began. And that's not talked about. These people just didn't voluntarily say, yeah, we just want to go, right? If you don't think that there were any skirmishes or anything while the Trail of Tears was occurring, um, then you need to rethink that <laughs> because um, there were these different instances, which to Kim's point, when individuals were able to escape and branch off, there were both various different communities that were able to be to be um, created, uh, you know, maroon communities. And like, again, like she had stated, um, you know, these different branches of uh, a particular tribe that may have been on the Trail of Tears that were able to escape and then create these own settlements for themselves. And so, um, I always like to highlight the heroism also that had to occur uh, throughout this process through some of these ancestors that were able to survive. And so um, that's just to pay homage to those individuals for sure. Um, so um, Brian is going to run the trailers uh, for these, uh, for the film. Uh, one of the trailers we released in 2021 and the other one was released in 2022. And um, we'll give you some details on when we expect the film to be finished and uh, any other questions that uh, Brian may have for us. 
So to be Afro-Indigenous to me is the burden or the honor, however you look at it, I'd say I look at it as a little of both, of telling three stories. I'm very proud of being Native and of being Black because I feel as though we are two of the most predominant creators in the world. For the entirety of the time that my ancestors have lived in this country, my African and my indigenous ancestors have lived in this country in contact with Western culture, it has tried to destroy them. Walter Pleckler was like the father of eugenics. And right around the 1900s, 1920s, he was reclassifying Native Americans as colored. If the census people came and they found out you were Indian, they would take you out back and shoot you in the head. I think that's a lot of the reason why we struggle with anti-blackness is because we were reclassified as black. And a lot of people in the community felt like they had to detach from being black because they were seeking recognition from the colonial settler state. As a Native American person and coming from a mother who looks like this, not only was I like often ostracized be, like by people just in the world, uh, but it felt especially intentional when it was my own family members doing the attacking. Our invisibility, our suffering, our generational trauma exists today. One of the biggest contributors to the erasure of Afro-Indigenous people is that so many people are in love with this fake Hollywood idea of what an Indian has to look like. And that drives them to tell people who look different, who challenge that, to say, you're not real, you're not authentic, you don't count, etc. To those who do not see me as Indian looking, I say, what does an Indian look like? Because we are such a multitude of colors, shapes, sizes, eye colors, hair textures. We are a variety of people. I can't imagine what it is like to try to survive all of the traumas of war, of genocide, of slavery, of disease, of depopulation, and to still wake up the next day and decide that you are going to love your children so much that you are not going to let this be their story, and you are going to make something different. And to have to do that again and again and again, generation after generation until I am here, that is what resilience is. Indian woman, I think about the impact and sacrifices that my ancestors had to make. I think about all those things in the culture, the music, the art, the dance, all those things that they taught me that were oral histories passed down through generations. And I'm very intentional about making sure that I show presence to both of my ancestors, both African and Native American. So we're sitting here in the historic Franklin Masonic Hall nationally recognized as a historic landmark by the Department of the Interior through the National Park Service for its involvement, its placement within American Indian removal history. African Americans were enslaved in the Cherokee Nation but were also integrated um, into their kinship structures as well. When we talk about 10,000 people experiencing the Trail of Tears, wintering over at the Ohio River, that the number also includes those African American people, whether they're enslaved or part of families. We used to fight together, and it's not our way to hate our brother. That's not our brother. It's not our way to ostracize people who don't look like what we've been told we're supposed to look like. Both groups Native people and enslaved Africans had one enemy, the same enemy. So that was a natural alliance for us to join forces together.
So a couple of questions um, that I'm kind of thinking about as you're going through, and I'm thinking about um, specifically when you're talking about opposing forces and backlash. And I saw the words uh, social norm kind of be introduced into that conversation. Can you just talk to to the audience who who might not be in that, um, what that looks like or what that experience has been, what you all have seen, if you will? Yeah, I can jump in first. Um, for me, with Black Indians in C started in 2019 as like a social media platform. And then in 2022 is when I really pursued it as being a nonprofit organization. But in that time of it being a social media platform and promoting the film, you know, because we were filming in late 2020, 21, 22, I saw, you know, in the comment section, there were some negative Nancy's, you know, there were some that were in there that had comments that felt, you know, the organization itself and the film was a threat to tribal sovereignty, that it was to be a disruption to how people do their tribal enrollment and how they are with tribal government and council and how they treat Afro-Indigenous people. And I've wanted it to be a focal point of discussion of not necessarily decreasing tribal sovereignty, but to open the doorway of thinking about how we treat one another. When you know people are your actual ancestors, your descendant, they're descendants of your ancestors. They're your relatives, they're your cousins, whether they're distant cousins or close cousins or cousins you knew about or did not know about, but you find out that they have this connectivity to you and your community, but they've been disconnected for whatever reason that may be. It may be social injustice. It might be family moved away for other opportunities, whatever it may be, but they're wanting to reconnect. I'm really about supporting people who are trying to reconnect to their journey of home. Um, I grew up in a household where I got to know both ethnic backgrounds really well. But not everybody has my shared experience. And I've also seen online where sometimes the reconnection journey can be tricky, where people only want to highlight one side of the reconnection and not highlight both sides of their dual ancestry. And I think for me, I'm so proud that I was taught to identify with both just as much. So I celebrate Black History Month as much as I do Native American Heritage Month. It's not me picking one over the other. But those opposing forces, yes, I did encounter quite a few people, not many, that were intentional about trying to disrupt, you know, the progress we were making, you know, with the film or either Black Indians and in C specifically. But it's been very quiet when they've seen the great quality of work that we're doing and the historical documenting that we've been doing. Because these are not opinions. These are things that have been historically documented and that you cannot dispute it's there it's reality i think it's now people becoming more comfortable with the identity of knowing they do share that same ancestry as well and mm -hmm. in, in, in a lot of cases always knowing but just intentionally uh, suppressing it for whatever reason i don't know um well i do we do know but um do you do your ancestors uh, a disservice by intentionally uh, weeding out one versus the other, right? This isn't a time in which individuals uh, like our previous, uh, like the, the previous ancestors that you saw from Kim and I, to where they had to choose, right? Like by force to a, to a certain degree. Um, or, or just to, uh, when Walter Plecker and his cronies would come around, uh, you know, if you would answer that you were uh, an indigenous person, then there could be physical consequences that 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 could occur, and so those times aren't here anymore. And so our goal is to hope that more people will embrace the, all of their ethnicities, right? Um, but uh, we're finding that with this project, yeah, there's been um, some in, some individuals who are naysayers and some individuals who, quite frankly, one person says your project won't see the light of F and day. Um, and we kind of just take that and laugh at it, <laughs> say in our good Southern ways, bless your heart. And, uh, and we keep it, we keep it moving. And cause we, we have a, um, we have an end game with this. We have a desired outcome and there's a lot of people that have the same. 
And so that's what keeps us motivated. We don't necessarily lean into what it is that all of the detractors uh, have said and have to say. That's good advice. And that's, uh, that's a smart way to be. The other thing that kind of stuck out uh, to me in, in, in this conversation kind of dovetails in this, but I love the fact that you both have backgrounds in, in as mental health professionals. And so that um, mindset and perspective bringing into this work, I think is such an, an important thing in terms of the way that we are talking about history, specifically in the time period that we're talking about history. So can we talk a little bit more about what potentially how to address uh, historical trauma um, through kind of maybe different lenses as as we've talked about in this um, is in this presentation, maybe what that work looks like going forward. I think for me as a person who's been clinically trained as a clinical social worker and therapist, it begins with a conversation. It begins with you having to be open to the idea of change and openness and willingness to adapt that change and put it into motion and practice. The community screenings for me are gonna be really important about bringing that impact, about talking about community change, but also thinking about how that perspective can be something you take back to your own communities to discuss. If I've always encouraged this on my social media platforms, if you serve on tribal council, be the light in the room. Be someone to bring back educational resources and interest to communities that may be marginalized or may not have access to some of this knowledge and be able to discuss and make this an open discussion. If you're someone who's been tribally enrolled and you're Afro-Indigenous, this is an opportunity for you to bring back connection and research about this as well. Not that I'm trying to put the weight on one particular person or group, because I'm not, because as a collective, all of us of various ethnic backgrounds can do better. But this is where we start those community conversations about historical trauma. We now have technological research where we can see this in real time of researching these historical documents that these things took place. But with those things taking place, what do we do now in 2023 and onward to make sure that we are doing some practical things to cause the decrease of how the stigma has happened? So for example, if someone is serving on a tribal council, look at your bylaws. Do your bylaws speak to the tribe for 2023 or do your bylaws speak to the tribe of 1923 or 1823? Think about what your bylaws say in today's society for your own sustainability. That's a big issue that's always talked about across Indian country is sustainability of tribal communities. Well, this this is a time for you to look at your legislative work. What do you have when you in writing that represents what your tribe represents in this present day, not necessarily what it was 200 years ago or 100 years ago or 50 years ago, whenever your tribe was established. But I think it's really, that's a tangible example of let's review the bylaws. Let's review our tribal enrollment packets. Let's think about how are we inclusive or not inclusive to people that truly can support and serve. And then once people are enrolled, think about how the communication of that reconnection journey is for your newly enrolled Afro-Indigenous members. Think about that. I've heard too many stories and it's not picking on any tribes, so I won't say a tribe, but I've heard too many stories across the board of Afro-Indigenous people being enrolled and then never heard about again that they can't get anyone to answer their phone calls or emails from tribal office. They have no connection back to culture. No one is willing to be a mentor, any of that. And I'm tired of hearing those stories. So I wanna see that type of historical regrouping take place. Mm -hmm. And then also creating a safe space. A lot of people um, keep quiet because they don't have a safe space. They don't have a space in which they can, again, be their true authentic self to where they can ask questions, right? It was once encouraged to, to in, in grade school to raise your hand and ask questions so we can educate you on X, Y, and Z, right? Uh, and that's just not the case anymore. It's either you're in it or you're out, right? Uh, when I look at some of these different roles in which my individuals were on and which they applied for numerous years, they rejected, 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 did not grow, did not live near uh, uh, indigenous community or some type of wording that, that says that, uh, but when you talk about the, in, the institution of slavery, where individuals were removed and sold from these different places, how are they supposed to live in that community when they've been removed from it? 
right? And so there's so many different things that happen that people have enough common sense and understanding that, to know that when these different migrations happened during the institution of slavery or even right after the institution of slavery when people were moving um, to better themselves that they didn't have connections with those places anymore. Um, whether it's because a person may have went up north or a person may have went out east, right? It just weren't cars like that in the 18, uh, late 1800s to where individuals may have had access to just hop in a car like we do today and just go and be reconnected and stay with those ancestors, right? And so, uh, or, or you know, stay with relatives or to, to even reconnect. And so we have to create these safe spaces, whether it's virtually, whether it's face-to-face, -to, -face, to where learning is, is part of uh, the curriculum in that, as well as this genuine acceptance and this gathering of uh, things that we've collected uh, over the years to say, okay, now let me re-embrace uh, uh, this, this relationship that was once there from our shared ancestors and accept you back in, right? And show you the way. And that's not just from uh, a black person going to an indigenous tribe and trying to be reintegrated, but that's also vice versa because we've also had where individuals who had grew up in indigenous communities says that you know they may not necessarily know how to connect to their blackness, right? And so this is a this isn't just a one way street. This is a two way street, and that's why the intersectionality is important because the 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 um, culture from both of these different groups uh, are intertwined in so many different ways. We talk about food ways, uh, bead work, uh, you know, clothing. I mean, there's just so many different things that uh, are closely connected. And um, it would be a shame if we keep functioning in these silos and not creating the safe spaces for individuals to come together as a united front to um, help advocate for these different issues that are happening and repair some of these issues. I love that Frederick said that because I'll piggyback real quick and say that that's right, it is on both sides. So for people that identify as African-American only and you have family member that's indigenous that wants to reconnect to their African-American side, that welcomingness of feeling that that reconnection can happen. And then even also for those who are researching your family history and family members of African-American may feel like, well, why are you researching this? Why is this important? I've lived as a black person my whole life now. Why should I now start saying I'm black and native? Why should I start saying this and not feeling discouraged or feeling that they'll be isolated or people not trusting their responses? So it works both ways. And I'm so glad Frederick brought that up. Great. So this has been an excellent conversation. I guess um, moving to kind of wrap up, um, we talk a lot about, uh, specifically in this area, we talk about Trail of Tears and we talk about removal um, because so much of that, you know, uh, came through the area, Florence, Muntel Shoals, um, along the Tennessee River, overland routes, water routes, so there's a, there's a large connection here to that, um, these traumatic um, historical events. And we talk about, you know, we talk about removal and we talk about, you know, uh, enslaved people coming in and then kind of um, uh, that sort of dual trauma of removal and then forced uh, migration. Of, of enslaved African-Americans in uh, specifically Alabama and Northwest Alabama, where we are right now. Um, was hoping that you could talk just a little bit more about uh, the presence of enslaved Africans on the Trail of Tears. Um, I know the second trailer kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, can you share just a little bit of your research of what that was like, what you what you found, and some stories that you found, perhaps. So for me, I'll go first. Um, something that was really profound is when we got to Oklahoma, and when we were in Oklahoma, we were able to look at some of the university archives, and we got opportunity to read some of the documentation of people that were um, enslaved and brought to that area. And we got to also meet people who were in present day fighting for the rights back of their ancestors because they are considered freedmen who are people who are descendants of the people that were enslaved that were on the Trail of Tears. 
And so for the specific Freeman, we got an opportunity to meet because I want to give spoilers away for the <laughs> film. Um, we were able to see about the documentation about how people were unjustly removed from their rights and how there was these promises that was these actual treaties that we were seeing that were made that people who were of this ancestry that were African enslaved people that are considered freemen had these lifelong rights, long-term rights to have access to tribal sovereignty and rights within these specific five civilized tribes. And so that's where I got to see historically it written these actual treaties about how these rights were supposed to remain. And I understand why people are so passionate to have those rights restored today. Um, those rights were lost in the late 70s, around 1978, 79. And people are fighting for their rights to have them restored now in present day. And that fight's been going on, as you can hear, over 40 years. But it's just the idea that even past all that time of the Trail of Tears, people had those rights and we get to the late 70s and those rights are stripped away. And that's why history is so important. That's why I love history and researching it because if we don't, we'll always think that they never had rights to begin with. But no, they had rights, but they are, they are fighting for restoration. And that's a, a piece that really stood out to me with my travels between Tennessee and Oklahoma, looking at the Trail of Tears from that standpoint of I'm meeting a real life descendant of as people who were ancestrally enslaved on this Trail of Tears. And now they're fighting for the rights of their people's um, tribal identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with some of these individuals that were on, the, the, listen, there, there was no port to bring enslaved people to Oklahoma. You see that in Savannah, Charleston, all along the coast, right? Because that's that it makes sense, right? There's different ports that are there in which and waterways in which you can bring enslaved individuals, Alabama, all these different places. So black folks got to o Oklahoma somehow, right? Um, and so what we're finding and what we had found by being out there is that with some of these individuals, as Kim is speaking of, uh, they're able to identify with a person that may deem himself 100% indigenous, the exact same grand, great grandparents. I mean, I mean, like literally great grandparents or great great grandparents. They're and they function in that vein as a family up until a certain period of time to where their rights were stripped away. And so, what we're finding is how baffling it is that both of these individuals understand and know exactly where their kinship linkage is. Um, and know how they both got here. They had the same exact story, born in Tennessee, born in Kentucky, born in North Carolina, born in Alabama. Everyone ends up in this small town in Kentucky. I mean, I'm sorry, in, in Oklahoma. How do these individuals get there, right? Forced removal, as well as what we know as um, the enslavement also of, of individuals of African descent by indigenous uh, people of indigenous descent as well. And there's this book that's called um, The Black Indian Slave Narratives, which is really, really, really good book. And it talks in depth about the connection between the two groups and um, how Ross, I uh, can't remember, Chief Ross, I believe, um, out of Georgia, uh, was one of the other individuals that brought his individual to individuals, uh, enslaved individuals as well, to uh, Oklahoma. And uh, that's where they settled, right? And so, so we know that there's a lot of different complexities that are there because they were also family groups that were there as well from a consensual standpoint, right? From an agreed uh, sense of this is the person who is my significant other. We created life together. We love each other. We function in both of our cultures. There's no issues, right? And so um, it's a very complex story when um, a simulation takes place and in, in which um, uh, one of the individuals in our documentary, she says, it's not our way to hate our brother. That's not our brother, right? Uh, Amina says that, and which is really, really um, compelling because she's acknowledging this kinship, whether it's a, a blood relation or it's not a blood relation, right? She's speaking directly to an indigenous uh, um, way that has been lost right, uh, to where now some individuals may say, well, I got to check your blood quantum, right? Well, is that exact same thing happening to a majority white 
individuals that are enrolled in these tribes. And we know historically that's just not the case, right? And so um, to, to your question, there's so many different ebbs and flows and so many different complex entities to the Trail of Tears that, uh, you know, hopefully with the film, some individuals will be able to get a smidget out of that and have a better understanding of uh, holistically what that looked like, because it's stuff that we're still all learning today. Wow, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's so much here. There's such a good conversation um, and such a meaningful presentation and such meaningful work that y'all are doing and really looking forward to the documentary uh, and the film coming out. So anything more that you would like to add? Yes, please follow us at Black Indians NC on Facebook and Instagram. You can also find Frederick on, um, and I love his TikTok, by the way, History Before Us. You can find him over there on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. But really just get ready. We're posting things about, you know, when we are out and about getting through the process of filming please follow us to learn about opportunities how to donate and support the film if you're interested in that um, we're very much excited about this film and setting up community events and things to get screenings to come up but yes definitely follow us on social media to keep in touch and we'd love to hear your comments great well thank you so much for being here and um, we're really looking forward to the film and we will um, be sure to share your information as we move forward about the film. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody.